Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of r slash pro revenge. In today's episode, you're replaceable. Okay, bye. How Mrs. Reliable got her douche bag of a boss fired. Turnabout is always fair play. Before we get started make sure to subscribe so you will never miss a video. So let's get started. You're replaceable. Okay, bye. I worked for a company for just under 5 years. The company I worked for existed for an additional 10 years prior to me. While I worked at this company, it ballooned to be the number one provider in the region for its unique service with about 75% of the market. It was a small business of about 15 employees. I loved my job and the skills I learned while working there were quite valuable. I loved my team and the clients we provided services for. My twice yearly reviews with the owner were always 10 out of 10 with no recommendations for improvement. I was exceptional at my job in every way. I handled company operations, HR slash payroll, customer service, marketing, employee management, schedules, employee and client training, and many other things at this company. I was also able to step in and do any of my teammates' jobs if they were out sick or on vacation. The owner of the company was giving out a bonus late summer last year in mine, while being more than previous years, was notably less than my teammates. I asked owner, are the bonuses related to performance, and if so, what could I have done to earn more? Owner replied, the bonuses are not performance related, you are just more replaceable than the others. Oh, okay, I replied and I proceeded to process each of the bonuses then went to lunch. I called my spouse to gain wisdom and advice. I was pretty lit but didn't want to make a rash decision. My spouse is very intelligent and, while they are not a fortune teller, they have an ability to foresee various responses and all the potential outcomes. They are business-wise and have been on the executive team of a large company for the past 21 years, while also serving on several community boards and business advisory boards. We decided together to continue forward with our scheduled vacation and use the time away to calm our minds, relax, have fun, and to also determine the best course of action for me. We were leaving after working one more day, so I worked like all was normal the rest of the day and the following day, then left on vacation. While away we discussed several scenarios, the potential outcomes, consulted with a business advisor and a business attorney. With all the advice I received I determined that upon my return from vacation, I would resign from my role with a two-week notice. However, in a fit of rage I was immediately terminated by owner. Which was one of the scenarios we thought would happen, so I was prepared for owner's poor reaction. During the next couple weeks, I created and opened a competing business offering similar services. However, I offered more customizable options with higher quality service and results. I knew our clients wanted these options and had proposed said options several times at old workplace, but was never green-lighted to implement the changes for no reason other than owner didn't come up with the idea, so it was a stupid idea. I also maintained communications with a few people from my old team. My old team did not relay the day-to-day -day happenings at my previous workplace, and I never asked about the company however, they would vent to me on occasion. I would listen without comment. I knew service, quality, and the work environment in general suffered since my departure. Moral went down and clients were less satisfied. I also read the Google and Facebook reviews for old company. Yikes! Additionally, two full-time and one part-time persons were hired to fill my role, and a portion of my responsibilities, like HR and payroll, were filled by outside companies. I quickly built up my business and within three months was able to hire several of my old teammates. They were able to jump in on day one with minimal training, as they were the best employees at my old workplace. The quality of previous workplaces' offerings continued to fall which sent additional business my way and quickly caused incoming work to be non-existent at old workplace. My old workplace went from being the number one provider of unique service in the region to nothing in a matter of months. My previous employer is now searching for gainful employment. I know this because over the weekend owner applied for a position at my spouse's company. Side note. 
I think my spouse's company should bring my previous employer in for an interview, but when they arrive, surprise. I'm the interviewer and all I say is, how replaceable am I now? My spouse, rightfully so, has said, no. Moral of the story, don't tell your employees they are replaceable because they might create a competing business that is better than yours, while taking your best employees and your clients which will leave you with no business to sell, owner's whole retirement plan was to sell business, and starting all over by searching for employment under someone else. Looks like your company was replaceable, not me. How Mrs. Reliable got her douche bag of a boss fired. Hey everyone. Long time lurker on this subreddit first time posting and boy do I have a story. So, letting everyone know that it's going to be a long post. Just letting everyone know ahead of time. Background. I've been working the retail business for over 20 years, and let me tell you. Some of the managers they hire I can do a better job. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Over the years of doing retail I have established a reputation for myself. I'm Mrs. Reliable. Need some to come in? They call me. Need someone to stay late? They call me. Need to switch with someone because management said no for your day off? They call me. Need to switch with someone because of a last minute plans? They call me. You can probably see where this story might be going, right? This story takes place a couple of years ago when I worked a major grocery store in my town slash city as a cashier. The story. This has taken place a couple of years ago back in 2020. I'm on my two years at this store and we went through so many people and managers it wasn't funny. Literally it felt like we had a revolving door with how much turnover and employment we had. Getting back to the story, I was a cashier and the thing about me doing the this job is that I have a tendency to be too good at my job. I was just hired to be a cashier, I was not a manager, nor a monitor, someone that is a step down from management, but doesn't have all the responsibilities of management, nor was a customer service. However, I was trained for nearly all the duties of someone who is. Need change? I went to cashier, got the money out of the draw, and went to grab the change that they needed. Need an override? I came over see what the problem is and did the override. Need something from behind the counter? I just need to know what it is that you need and I went and grabbed it. I did all this on top of my cashier duties and self-checkout duties. Then Dushabag came along. My manager at the time, let's call her Ashley. Ashley is the front-end manager, meaning she's in charge of everything that goes on at the registers, cash office, where all the money is, customer service and the self-checkouts. Now, I liked Ashley. She was a really good boss, and I liked working with her. Ashley had gotten pregnant and was expecting her second child, I was excited for her. Unfortunately, when Ashley came back though she was no longer going to be a manager nor was she going to full-time. She decided to come back as part-time. I can't really blame her though. You're working 40 hours a week and are not allowed any overtime whatsoever. Plus, you can be working as early as 5 a.m. to working as late as whenever the last customer decides to leave, last time that happened when didn't get out until 11.15 p.m. Enter Dusha Bag. If you ever wonder what happened to that spoiled brat in school whose mommy never said no and always got what they always wanted. That's Dushabag all grown up in a manager's position. Dushabag was the type of manager that if he told you do something, he expected you to do it without any questions. Have plans after work? Dushabag expected you to whip out your phone right there and then, cancel your plans and come into work. Have a doctor's appointment? Dushabag expected to cancel that appointment and then come into work. If you told him no, he would say in the most condescending tone, well I need you to do anyway. And then just standing there scowling at you the whole time. Basically trying to intimidate you by making you feel so uncomfortable by the staring until you cave. The setup. Now, I had my fair share of awful managers to the point where if I didn't need the money, I would have walked right out right then and there and never returned. And I had my fair share of good managers. 
Dushabag was somewhere in the middle leaning more towards the walking out. Now, with me I'll admit. Over the years I developed a sassy sarcastic personality. I'm blunt, no filter, say what's on mind, and I don't put up with people's bullsh asterisk t. Apparently, Dushabag never got the memo of my not taking people's bullsh asterisk t. Around this time, summer was ending meaning we were in the now hiring stage, and many positions were starting to open up in the store. Keep this in mind. What Dushabag did to get me to start my pro revenge? Strike 1. I had out of patient vein surgery done one of my legs and needed to take a few days off. Since I had a some vacation time saved up, I used my hours for those few days that I didn't have to worry so much about not getting paid. Dushabag called me a day before I was supposed to come and asking if I can do a 9 to 1. I asked him three times over the phone, who's closing, because originally I was supposed to close that day until I got my approval for my days off. Dushabag never answered me so I just figured they had it covered. I came in and of course halfway through my shift Dushabag calls me over and says that they don't have a closer. Keep in mind that I asked him three times over the phone who was closing. Dushabag wanted me to clock out go home for a few hours and then come to work and close. I said no and then he tried the whole guilt tripping about not having anyone and that we really need you to this. I said no because one, I'm really tired and just came off surgery like three days ago. Two, I already made plans with my husband for the evening. Of course Dushabag didn't like this because the next time I came to work. Dushabag was just being petty and passive aggressive with me. Basically, he will either pretend I wasn't there, ignored me, or the transaction that he was doing was taking longer than it should and then chastise me in front of the customers for taking too long to get him. When I had my follow-up appointment with the vein doctor, Dushabag asked me if I can come earlier. I told him no, I can't because I have a doctor's appointment in the morning that day. Then he did his usual, well need you to do it anyway. And started to doing that stare with me. Unfortunately for him, I'm used to this when came to Karen's and Kevin's trying to intimidate me because something didn't come right. I quickly shut that down by getting the other cashier's attentions when they need help with something or quickly grabbed a customer's attention. When I came in after my appointment, Dusha bagged with a smug grin very loudly in earshot of the big wigs from corporate visiting that day. Well OP, looks like you noticed that I didn't call you and because we didn't need you. I replied, good because wasn't able to come in early anyway. Strike 2 Remember how I said that the store had openings? Well turns out customer service needed some help and the only way to get there was to ask your manager. So, I went to Dushabag and asked about being at the customer service desk. With everything that I've already been doing, I was basically the front-end assistant manager without the pay and title. Dushabag said that he would get back to me especially since I've been doing great job. Two to three weeks later, I'm seeing people that I trained or have started months after I did getting promoted to customer service desk while I stayed as a cashier with all the others' responsibilities piled on top. The customer service desk position would have easily been a 0 .50 cent raise. The monitor position would have been a 0.75 cent raise. And of course Dushabag didn't want to pay more for doing the exact same thing that I was already doing. I was starting to get the message of why pay for the cow when the milk is free? Strike 3 I was starting to look for another job at this point because I was getting sick and tired of how I was being treated, but I wanted to try and give this guy one last chance. So, I found out that the seafood department in my store had an opening and I even talked to the seafood department manager Debbie about me possibly being in her department. He was ecstatic to have and was willing to work around my college schedule. I had to talk to my manager Dushabag in order to get the transfer going. I talked to Dushabag and he started to come up with any and all kinds of excuses to not have me transfer. I quickly shot that down and even the one where he tried to say that I can't because another coworker was transferring, first time I've heard of this, but the coworker said they had no problem with me going. So, I thought that was that, right? Wrong. Three to four weeks have passed and I've been getting nowhere with the whole transferring to the other department. 
Even Debbie was wondering why it was taking so long for get to the seafood department and why management was dragging their feet with this. Turns out, Dushabag blocked my transfer and they wound up hiring a new employee to the seafood department. Dushabag thought that if there was no positions available and he can just deny my transfer that I have no choice but to stay. After an argument between the two of us about this, because I was calling him out on his bullshit. Dushbag said the magic words. Just do your job. K the malicious compliance. Just do my job? Okay. I was so glad that the wearing a mask was required. Otherwise, Dushabag might have seen my evil smile when I agreed to just do my job. Need an override? Sorry, but I'm not management nor am I a monitor so I can't do that. Let me go grab someone who can. Need change? Sorry, but I'm not management nor am I a monitor so I can't do that. Let me go grab someone who can. Need something behind the customer service desk? Sorry, but I'm not trained nor am I customer service. Let me grab someone who can get that for you. Dushabag was at his wit's end and even tried to write up for something. I quickly shut that down when I started to recite what being a cashier entails and what my actual job of being a cashier is. And I told him that if he wants to me to continue with all those responsibilities that he needs to promote me so I can do all those responsibilities. He quickly stepped back into being his passive-aggressive behavior that I quickly shut down. I eventually found another job with a better pay and better benefits and handed in my resignation of me leaving in 10 days. That douchebag tried to deny and say, no you have to give us two weeks notice. I quickly shut that down with a response, you wouldn't be giving us a two week notice if you're going to fire us. Or lay us off or let go. Just a two minute warning. K the petty revenge. Now, you're probably wondering what could I have possibly do for the petty revenge right? Well, there was an old saying, never kill the golden goose. Well, readers what do you think happens to a department that is solely dependable on one person whose reputation is, Mrs. Reliable? Need me to come in on my day off? Sorry I can't. I have plans. Need me to stay late? Sorry, I can't I already made plans. Some called out? Sorry, I can't make it. I did this throughout my entire rest of my stay at that place. Dushabag couldn't do anything about either, and it was starting to get to him on what happens when you rely heavily on someone else, but treat them so badly that they actually decide to leave. Dushabag's performance because I wasn't there to cover his as was starting to take a toll. He had to do some much now, of his own responsibilities, and there wasn't a thing he could do to me. He kept trying to be extra passive-aggressive with me to which I just smiled and waved and said goodbye to everyone but him. Now this wouldn't be a pro-revenge without the pro-revenge. After talking to a friend of mine about what happened when I worked there, he told me to report this to the district manager because that kind of behavior isn't good for the workplace. K the pro-revenge. I got the email address of the district manager from my friend and then I went back to the store as a customer. I kept in touch with a couple of my old co-workers and kept asking them how they were doing and how's work going. None of them had a problem inventing to me on how bad things were getting with Dushabag. I asked if they didn't mind if I put their name in the complaint or if they just wanted to be anonymous. A lot of them choose the latter. I whipped out my phone used the quick memo app that I had and quickly wrote the notes in my phone. The date and the register that the cashier was on at the time. I sent that email with the attached notes and with the entire account on my part as well to the district manager. Now, this wouldn't be a pro-revenge if it just stopped there. I took a step further. You see, with the receipts that we get. There is a survey on the bottom of every receipt and management kept trying to boost us to get customers to take the survey because it helped with the story front and all the points that the store gets. Well, here's the thing about that survey, when you fill out the survey including the comments. Everyone gets to see it. And I mean everyone, I mean everyone. Dushabag, the assistant store manager, the store manager, the regional manager, the district manager, and the representative of Cooperate, gets to see it all. 
So, you can imagine what I did. Needed a snack for school? Filled out the survey. Needed groceries? Filled out the survey. Needed a drink? Filled out the survey. I went to that store multiple times and gotten so many different surveys because there wasn't a limit for how many you can fill out. And I made sure to put everything that Dushabag was doing on all those surveys, including how he treated his employees. Three months after I left, the person they hired back in seafood to make sure I couldn't go back there quit. Six months after I left, Dushabag was nowhere to found. A new manager took over for him, and no one seems to know what happened to Dushbag. Turnabout is always fair play. I'm not sure if this one belongs here as I was not the one actually wronged, my revenge was taken for someone I have never met, and I honestly don't know if they personally got any satisfaction from it. I do know what it did to the perpetrator and that it satisfied me, so I'll let the readers decide. Like many of my tales, this one takes place in the distant past, before cell phones were common, and before universal caller ID was the norm, in a time dinosaurs most likely roamed the earth. Well, the 80s, at least. These things are very important to this story. Our tale takes place in a large west coast city known for a big orange bridge and delicious sourdough bread. I was living in the city for several months working temporary duty for my company, and was preparing for work on the day in question. As was my custom I was getting dressed listening to the morning radio show on a local station. This station's jocks had started doing something called the Monday morning wake-up call, where, on the first day of the week, they would make a prank call on the air to a victim chosen from write-in suggestions from the listening audience. Doing this was actually very controversial in radio circles at the time, I had been a radio DJ in my hometown for a few years, and there are rules you must follow. One of the biggest rules is that you can't make a false or deceptive radio transmission, like announcing an emergency, sending an SOS or cry for help or other such deceptions. Doing so is a federal offense, you can lose your license and be fined or even do jail time. It's a big no-no. The debate has long since been decided, but at the time doing prank calls on the air was a gray area, there were people who were sure it constituted a false transmission, and some stations refused to do it. The argument was still alive at the time this happened. This day happened to be Monday, and the intended victim had been nominated by her husband, they had experienced a power failure at home earlier in the week, and the husband, as suggestion was that the station call his wife, claim to be from the utility, and tell her that the power outage was somehow their fault, and they would have to pay for it. The station staff loved the idea, and they proceeded to call the wife at her place of employment, a local bank. The victim answered and the prank began. Hello, is this Mrs. Victim? I'm John Doe from Area Power Company. Do you remember having a power failure earlier this week? Well, it was due to a blown transformer on your block and we've determined that the cause is a wiring fault in your house. We may have to cut off your power until you get it fixed. Also, you will be charged for the transformer. The total cost is X thousand dollars. Would you prefer we put that on your utility bill, or do you want to make other arrangements to pay? As you might imagine, the woman was shocked, then scared. As she asked for more information, having trouble believing that they were going to have to pay thousands of dollars, she got increasingly more upset. This egged the radio staff on, the guy making the call kept increasing the pressure on her more and more, eventually telling her that her power would likely be cut off until payment was made, and that there might be a lawsuit. After several minutes she suddenly hung up in tears. He called her back, and when she heard his voice she hung up again, crying even harder. This time the guy waited a minute and then called back again. Another lady answered the phone, a co-worker, and he asked to speak to Mrs. Victim. When the co-worker asked his name he replied this is her husband, distinctive first name. The co-worker cursed at him, called him a liar and hung up. The radio studio was filled with laughter, the jocks thought it was hilarious. They took calls from listeners who were all laughing and talking about what a great prank it was. They finally got the husband on the phone, he of the distinctive name, and he was also laughing and joking that he'd surely be sleeping on the sofa tonight. 
He was congratulating the radio staff on the fine job they had done terrorizing his wife. The radio hosts promised the listening audience that, because the prank was so funny, they would certainly be playing the whole recorded prank again at noon, so be sure to be listening and call your friends. I in my efficiency apartment listening to this was getting mad. I was still pretty newly married and couldn't imagine doing something like that to my wife. All I could think of while the staff and listeners on the radio were laughing was that, a few miles away, a young woman was in the ladies' room crying, probably with co-workers trying to calm her down. What made it worse to my mind was that the guy who set her up for this was the one guy in the world who should have her back, her husband. Anger turned to resolve, resolve formed a plan. I grabbed the city phone book, remember it's the 80s, and looked up two phone numbers. I called the first one. You may remember that I said I had been a radio disc jockey myself. It was a tiny, daunted-esque station, but I knew how stations worked, I knew what they liked, and more to the point, I knew what they did not like. I also had done a lot of voiceover work and could sound professional as heck. The phone rang and was answered. You've reached K asterisk asterisk asterisk, radio jerk. I launched my attack. Me, professional voice, yes, this is George Smith, I picked a more believable name, from the city, office of the Federal Communications Commission. I've been getting some disturbing calls about your morning radio show, and I need to speak to your program director to discuss it. Radio guy one, stammering, uh, he's not, um. Here right now. Let Majiti Asomi and Eels. I was put on hold. After a few moments. Radio Guy 2, also stammering, hi, um, hello. Uh, this is Radio Guy 2. Um. You're from the FCC. Me, yes, this is George Smith from the, city, office of the Federal Communications Commission. As I told your co-worker, I've been getting some disturbing calls about your morning radio show, and I need to speak to your program director to discuss it. Radio Guy 2, short silence, uh huh. He's not in yet. He'll be here at, um, 9 o'clock. Me okay, well I can start with your station manager since he will need to be in the conversation as well. Radio guy 2, breathing fast, starting to lose all his composure, oh wow, um, he gets in at 9 too. I um, I I can, um, can I have him call you? He half asked and half pleaded. Me, letting out what I hoped was a bureaucratic sounding sigh. Very well. I will expect to hear from him at 9. I will need to speak to your station manager, your programming director, and very likely your on-air personnel from this morning. I'll also need your station logs. Radio Guy 2 oh, yes sir. I'll make sure he calls you right away. Me alright, I'll be expecting his call. Here's my number. At this point I gave Radio Guy 2 the second number I had looked up in the phone book, the main number for the, city, office of the Federal Communications Commission. Radio Guy 2 stammered his thanks and promises of phone calls, and we hung up. I went back to the radio. Jerk disc jockey UHHHH OOHHHHH. The FCC is calling. Well, they can't do anything to me. I've got a year of pre-law in college and blah blah blah. He continued his defiance for a few minutes and then went to commercial. I kept listening. They stopped talking about the prank call. They stopped taking phone calls from listeners. They stopped talking to the husband. They started playing music. A lot of music. I listened for the rest of the day. They didn't talk about it the rest of that day, and they didn't replay it at noon. In fact, for the rest of the week I listened and heard nothing about it. I was a bit surprised, I figured that they might stop talking about it for a little while, but not altogether. It wasn't until later that I realized why they went so silent. I had scared them. In my quest to get a little vengeance for that crying woman I'd never met, I scared them, but more to the point I'd embarrass them, and jerk disc jockey had helped. Once he went live with his bravado against the call from the feds their listeners knew they'd been called and heard the silence afterward too. They were embarrassed because I had just done to them what they had done to her, 
and they didn't want to have to admit it. I've kept the rather distinctive name of the husband a secret, because I have always wished that I could meet that poor woman, and that name would be how I would know it was really her. I doubt she is still married to the guy, but I'd like to let her know that in that place, on that day, someone had her back. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share, and we will see you in the next video.